George opened a zoo. He was attracting tourists from all over the world. His most popular exhibit was the giraffes. But every night, the giraffes seemed to manage to escape their enclosures. Well, George realized he didn't know much about giraffes, figured out they must be jumping the fence, so he raised the fence up from 10 feet tall and up to about 12 feet. But the giraffes still were found outside of the gate in the enclosure the next morning. So he raised it up to 15 feet. But in the morning, he found the giraffes wandering around outside of their enclosure, freely wandering around the zoo. So he hired some fence builders to be, build a new and stronger fence that was well over 20 feet tall. However, his efforts were in vain because in the morning when he came in, the giraffes were roaming the zoo freely and not in their enclosure. He decided he'd go all out. He found a fence builder who would guarantee a 60 foot tall fence and promise that no giraffe would possibly be able to jump that fence and escape. Construction began. George was elated the day that the fence was completed. However, the next day when George came into the zoo, he found the giraffes roaming freely throughout the zoo. Furious at the fence builder for failing to keep the giraffes enclosed, yet so proud that his giraffes could jump somehow a 60-foot fence, he didn't know what to do, but he called the fence builders and said, look, you guaranteed this. Either you give me my money back or you come and figure out what's going on, where the weak spot is that they keep jumping the fence. So they came and they asked George, can we spend the night to see where they're jumping, where they're getting out? Next morning, the giraffes were wandering around freely. The fence contractor had a huge smile on his fence. George was furious the giraffes were roaming, roaming freely and that the fence builder was actually happy about it. As soon as George got within voice range, he started yelling at the contractor and the contractor looked at him and said, George, George, wait, it won't matter how tall I build your fence if you keep forgetting to shut the gate. <laughs> there are certain things that are absolutely important to do, like shutting the gate to the giraffe enclosure. Some things are important also in regards to the church. And Paul, when he's writing to the Christians in Corinth, wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 that he delivered to them as of first importance. I know I preached from 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection back in April of this year, but today I want to focus especially on this phrase, as of first importance, and see what it was that Paul delivered to them and why it is of first importance, especially to the church that is called to transform. But first, let's start with prayer. <clears throat> Lord, I do thank you for your love, and I ask, Lord, that you would help us to pay close attention to what your word says. Lord, help us to see what is of first importance. May we always make sure that the church keeps that as the important thing. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> there are four thoughts regarding of, of first importance for the church that I want to share today from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 11. Starting with the gospel Paul preached. The first two verses there. Let me read this. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Even before Paul makes a statement of first importance, he's already reminding them about the gospel which he had preached to them. This is the gospel. It's the same one that was preached at the beginning of the church by Peter, Acts chapter 2, when we started looking at the very aspect of the church in Acts chapter 2. And it hasn't been changed no matter where they went. Even when you got a different preacher, Paul, he is still preaching the same gospel. Wherever he traveled, wherever he was, in front of whatever people was, he still preached the same gospel. Didn't matter if there was more money, if they wanted him to preach something different, he still preached the same gospel, the one gospel. And he continued to preach the one gospel. And it doesn't change. And to me, this is absolutely important because it is something we can stand upon. Just as also he said, in which you also stand. Brother Jared was sharing just last week about the sure, solid foundation the church is built upon. He shared that last weekend. And that is the confession of who Jesus is. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. He is that rock. He is that cornerstone. This gospel message centered upon Jesus as our foundation is one of the most important parts about Christianity. The gospel message is not changing. 
It won't change in the years to come. It is still the same gospel message. There are religions who have changed their doctrines and their teachings over the years. One large denomination has a lot of human leaders who over the centuries they've recorded their doctrines in their doctrinal books. And depending upon which human is the leader at the time, their doctrines have actually changed. Some things that were sinful are now not sinful. Some things that were permitted are now sinful. They're forbidden. And depending upon which leader was leading, the rules to live by changed. But you know what? God's word didn't change the entire time. There's another very fast-growing religious group that literally changed their doctrines about people of certain races to be able to abide by the laws of the United States of America. At one time, they forbid certain races to be able to go to heaven, and now they're suddenly okay to go with it. But you know what? God's word always accepted anyone of any race, of any nationality, of any tongue. The whole time, it never changed. Another religious group has voted to change God's word in many places to fit with their new, modern, updated views. But God's word has never changed. And the gospel message we still preach in the church is the same preaching gospel that Paul preached, that Peter preached. It's the same message. Sin is still sin today. When I grew up, I actually hated English class. I just didn't like it, didn't like spelling classes, didn't like the English classes, because all the time when we were there, they kept trying to tell me these spelling rules. Well, it's I before E, except after C, and in certain cases, like such and such and such and such and such, and I'm going, if you have a rule, make the rule and keep it. I did not understand why there were exceptions, why there were differences. I loved math class, because one plus one was always two. Two times two was always four. They didn't say, well, except in cases. No, it was always the same. That's why I loved math, but I hated English. And that's why I love the gospel, because the gospel hasn't changed. It is still the same gospel that Paul preached. And that's what he's telling us. It's something we can stand upon, and it's not going to change. And Paul also pointed out as a first importance that this gospel that he preached is not just something we can stand upon, knowing it won't change, but it's also that by which we are being saved. New American Standard says that we are saved by this gospel if we hold fast to it and our faith is not in vain. But other versions like Young's Literal Translation, New Revised Standard uh, Version, Wymouth's Translation, New Century Version, Lexham's English Version, English Standard Version, Common English Bible, there's a whole bunch of them. All, all try to translate this according to the Greek that we are being saved as we hold fast to this gospel without wavering. The main point of this gospel that Paul preaches that is saving us is it is saving those who are staying faithful to this gospel message, who are living this transformed life in Christ Jesus, that we must stay faithful because becoming a Christian is not the end. When we repent and we believe and we are baptized, that is not the end. That is the start. We must then be faithful. Otherwise, our faith can be in vain. That's exactly what, remember when we went through the seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation and we looked at those? Every one of those letters, they're commending them for their faith and then most of them are called to repent because they have a sin in their life, but all of them are told that you need to be faithful until death. Faithful until Christ comes. You need to be faithful or else I will come to you and punish you. I will erase your name from the Lamb's Book of Life. I will come against you as an enemy. But if they are faithful, they will be rewarded. They will be rewarded with crowns. They will be given the glory and the salvation in Christ Jesus. This gospel that Paul preached is of first importance. So let me continue reading. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. To the scriptures. See, everything in the Word of God that Paul preached had to be according to the scriptures. I've met preachers who have told me they don't believe in the Word of God. I've had some who told me that they don't even preach the Word of God anymore. 
To me, these are wolves in sheep's clothing. They should not be preaching in Christ's church. And Paul brought up that of first importance that the things that he preached were according to the scriptures. The authority for everything he preached came from the inspired word of God, the Bible, the scriptures. Because if the scriptures can't be trusted, what can be? So Paul preached a gospel that hinged on two very important facts according to the scriptures. First of all, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. His death was not an afterthought of God that God was going, oh man, oops, we got a problem. Oh, we got a thing. Caught me off guard. What are we going to do now? It was not that. Christ's death was in the predetermined plan of God, predetermined before the foundation of the world, before this world was ever created, before mankind ever sinned. When I finally caught on to that from Ephesians chapter 1, my whole view of God and His great love for us changed completely. I was going like, wow, that He loves people that much that He would go ahead and create us knowing His Son would have to die on a cross for us. This was God's plan all along. This is what He said, that Jesus was going to come and die for us. Jesus Himself was teaching over and over to His disciples that we're going to go down to Jerusalem where I'm going to be turned over to sinful men and they will put me to death. They will nail me to a cross and I will die and I will be buried and I will rise again. Sometimes in reading the Old Testament and how the Israelites were the chosen people of God, sometimes that makes me sad. It seems so limiting. Like if you weren't born from the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you were out. But that's a general picture rule. It's not the exclusion. Because when you read through the Old Testament scriptures, you find people, many people who were not born of that bloodline who are suddenly God's people. Remember Rahab? The harlot and her household, they were not from the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, but they're right in there. Remember Ruth? She wasn't of that bloodline, but she was right in there. How did these other people get in there? Because they lived by faith. They lived by faith. And God was showing his people, even in the Old Testament, it wasn't just that bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will accept anyone who will live by faith. All nations, all people, all races, all tongues, everyone has access to the Father through the blood of Jesus, through faith. The Old Testament kept pointing ahead to Christ dying for our sins. In fact, last week, Brother Jared even shared from Exodus. He talked about how that the Passover lamb sacrifice in Exodus was set up to be the foreshadowing of Christ being the true Passover lamb, our Passover lamb. Psalm 22 talks about that. Isaiah 53 prophesies about this. There's other passages that, that foretell the crucifixion of Jesus, that he would die for us. In fact, the earliest prophecy regarding the fact of what was going to happen to Jesus Christ is back in Genesis 3 when God told the serpent that the devil would bruise Jesus' heel like when he has the nails driven into his feet yet Jesus would crush the serpent's head he will defeat him Jesus himself pointed out over and over in his ministry years how many times that he was going to have to be lifted up on a cross. He had to die for their sins. How he had to go to Jerusalem, be turned over to the sinful men, and die for us on a cross. So Paul preached that Jesus, the Christ, he had to die according to the scriptures. That he, Jesus had to go and become a curse for us by hanging on a tree. That he had to shed his blood so he could give us the forgiveness of sins. That he had to be that sacrificial Passover lamb for us. And so Paul writes that Jesus had to die for our sins according to the scriptures. And then he writes that, that Jesus also had to be buried. And I think it's really kind of interesting that when Paul is writing about this, he tells us that he died according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again according to the scriptures. But he doesn't say according to the scriptures that he was buried. That makes me think, why does he put it in there? And I start wondering about it. Is this simply that he's trying to give us a proof beyond all shadow of a doubt Jesus really did die? I mean, how many of his friends would bury him while he was still alive? I wouldn't do that. 
They knew he died. This is proof beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was definitely dead. His friends, his followers would not have buried him if he was still alive. He was buried because it confirmed, it, it confirmed the very fact that he died according to the scriptures. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then the next of first importance in the scriptures is that Paul says, I preach that according to the scriptures, Christ was raised on the third day. God in the Old Testament testified that His Holy One, the Messiah, would not undergo decay. He would rise again. In the small book of, uh, of Jonah, in four chapters there, it records us about God's great compassion for, towards Jonah, who would be willing to repent, and towards the um, city of Nineveh when they were willing to repent. But Jonah didn't want Nineveh to repent. Remember, he ran away, and he's on a ship. A huge storm comes up, and they ask, whose fault is it? And Jonah goes, it's my fault. I'm trying to run away from God. The only way to solve this is throw me overboard. And they're going, like, we don't want to do that. They jettison everything else. Finally, they reject the, the aspect of jettisoning everything, and they take Jonah, throw him over. So, sea becomes calm, but a great fish swallows him. And the book of Jonah, chapter 2, tells us that Jonah spent how long in the belly of the fish? Three days. And Jesus uses that and said, the sign of Jonah will be the sign for the Son of Man. I will spend three days in the belly of the earth. And according to scriptures, that's what happened. He would rise again, similar to Jonah being spewed up out of the belly of the fish. It was all part of God's plan. The church, as of first importance, holds fast to the gospel that Paul preached. It's something we can stand upon because it's not going to change. It is something by which we are being saved if we hold fast to our, our faith in this. The church, as of first importance, we hold to things according to the scripture, looking at the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, according to the scriptures, the prophecies, the record of these events, all in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and again here in 1 Corinthians 15. It all is showing us that Jesus died and rose again for us. And along with this, the church, as of first importance, holds to that which has been proven by witnesses. <clears throat> Let me read some more. Starting again, verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which you also are being saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Pay attention here, starting in verse 5. And that He appeared to Cephas... Then to the twelve, after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. I can't help but point out that Paul's gospel that the church stands upon, upon first importance that Jesus' resurrection was not just testified according to the scriptures, but it was a fact that was proven by many witnesses. Paul shares the multitude of people that Jesus appeared to. Cephas, who was Simon Peter, the 12, over 500 people at one time, to James, to the apostles, to Paul himself. This testimony isn't on the statement of just one person or just a couple of people might have conspired to possibly tell a lie, but this is by multiple people over multiple times. When I'm driving, I spend a lot of time looking around, especially for wildlife when I'm in areas where there's wildlife. Many times while I'm driving, I'll be taking quick glances around, left and right, and I'll look around and go, oh, man, I thought that was a deer. I thought that was an elk. Uh, I thought that was an antelope. I thought that was, and I will take a second look, and sometimes it confirms what I saw, but sometimes I go, man, that's a good-looking tree. That's a good-looking rock. That's a good-looking bush. And that second look sometimes helped me realize what I thought I saw wasn't there. Quick glances can be very deceiving, but Jesus didn't just appear at a quick glance to just a few witnesses, but he was there for a long time. Remember the two on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24? He walked with them. 
He talked with them for miles along the road. He sat down to eat with them. Remember the seven up by the Sea of Galilee? He spoke with them. He ate fish with them. Or the twelve in the upper room, he appeared to them. He broke bread with them. He talked with them and even told Thomas, take your finger and put it in the holes in my hands. Take your hand and put it in the hole in my side. This wasn't a case of a quick glance. Oh, that person reminded me of so-and-so. Better look again. Oh, no, that's not them. Kind of looks like them, but not them. No, this was Jesus was there with them. It was lengthy, multiple people, multiple times. But my favorite witness on this is the unexpecting and hostile witnesses like Saul of Tarsus, later known as Paul, the guy who writes this. Saul didn't believe Jesus had risen from the dead. He decided Christians were liars. They were deceivers. He was so certain of it that they were doing wrong and they were lying that he actively pursued the arresting and the killing of Christians. He was going to stop their lie about a risen Savior. But then in Acts chapter 9, Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and it changed Saul's life. Once Ananias came and laid his hands on Saul and baptized Saul, Saul became a very outspoken proclaimer of who Jesus is, the risen Jesus. For Saul had seen Jesus alive from the dead. And according to tradition, Saul, who's later known as Paul, and throughout most of the New Testament is known as Paul, he's even in prison. He's put to death for proclaiming this gospel, which doesn't change. The gospel he could stand upon by which we are being saved if we hold fast to it. This gospel that is according to the scriptures, that Jesus died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose up on the third day according to the scriptures. This gospel that was proven by many witnesses, multiple people, multiple times, even by an unexpecting and hostile witness like Saul of Tarsus himself. But this is not where the of first importance ends. In verses 9 through 11, Paul emphasizes, by the grace of God. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Paul emphatically stated that what he is, the apostle preaching an unchanging gospel, that is according to the scriptures, that has been proven by many eyewitnesses, is because he was saved by grace. He admits he didn't deserve salvation. He didn't deserve God to look at him with favor. He doesn't deserve to be able to have a hope of the blessings of eternity up in heaven because he himself had been a persecutor of the Christians and a persecutor of Jesus. But our salvation isn't given because we have been such good people, perfect people. It's not because uh, we were such great people. It was given because of grace, God's grace for us. And I don't think there's many people truly, truly understand that, not even Christians. But people outside the church, they think they can't come to church. Why? Well, you don't know all the things I've done. I won't fit in. I'm a terrible sinner. I can't come in. They don't realize that God saves us, not because you're perfect, but he saves you by his grace. There are some people outside of churches who think that since they know some Christians who live completely unholy lives, that churches are simply full of hypocrites. But the real truth is that none of us, no Christian, actually lives perfect. We're all being made perfect through the grace of God, by the blood of Jesus Christ. We still all have a long ways to go. Some people in churches... Think preachers and others are so perfect that they themselves give up trying to be a Christian. I can't be like that preacher. I can't be like those other people at church. They have their lives all together. I can't do it. They don't realize that even the preacher and the other people are saved by grace. We're not perfect. We still struggle with temptations. We still struggle to live holy as our Father is holy. But thankfully, the grace of God saves us. And then there's others in churches who find out that their preacher or another preacher, that person sinned, and they totally give up on God. Christ and the church. 
Why? Because they don't realize that even preachers are people who are saved by grace. We're not perfect. And because Jesus is perfect, the only perfect sinless one who died for our sins, we can be saved by grace. Through faith in Christ Jesus, covered by his blood, given freely in the waters of baptism. And Paul points out that as of first importance, we are saved by grace. Yet Paul also points out that he has been laboring hard because of grace. When Jared and I were talking about this message, he shared a quote with me that said something like, Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Let me repeat that. Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. In other words, just because we're saved by grace doesn't mean you don't have to work hard at doing things for God. You're not going to earn that God's grace. But they still... Labor hard because of the grace of God. Paul understood that. He understood his salvation was not because he earned salvation by his great efforts, his hard labor, but rather due to the grace of God shown to him in a sinful state. And then Paul then was demonstrating his gratitude towards God, his gratitude towards Jesus, his gratitude for grace that was working in his lives. So that's why he was laboring hard to share God's grace with others. And we need to follow in Paul's footsteps. And as a church, we need to be sharing God's grace. This is of first importance. This is a priority. We as a church stand upon the gospel Paul preached. Not a new gospel. The same gospel as recorded for us in the scripture. Because as of first importance, we preach according to the scriptures. That Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. That he rose on the third day. We won't change this because it's of first importance. And as of first importance, we proclaim what was proven by witnesses. Multitudes of witnesses. Over multiple times. And even one. One very unexpected uh, hostile witness saw and we hold fast to the grace of God knowing we're saved by grace and thus out of appreciation we share grace with everyone lovingly thoughtful to people everywhere the church as of first importance builds upon the foundation of Jesus Christ with the gospel that Paul preached according to the scriptures proven by witnesses by the very grace of of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this gospel. I thank you, Lord, that as of first importance, we see this gospel message. The same one Paul preached, the same one that Peter preached, the same one all the apostles preached. This gospel message that is according to the scriptures, this gospel message that was proven by many witnesses, this gospel message that is about the grace of God that saves us. Lord, may we hold fast to that. May we share that with other people. Lord, may we be walking faithful for you. In Jesus' name.